Dive into America's coastal waters and discover a fascinating world rich with life and history. A realm of vibrant diversity, from the odd and reclusive to some of the largest creatures on Earth. Join Jean-Michel and the Cousteau team as they explore America's underwater treasures and the national marine sanctuaries created to better understand and protect them. It's Jean-Michel Cousteau, Ocean Adventures. More than half of America's borders are water, stretching over 12,000 miles of coastline. But a country doesn't end at the shore. It extends far into the ocean, lakes, and into the deep. Within these waters are found some of America's most important natural resources, places of incomparable beauty and irreplaceable artifacts of history all underwater treasures that, on the whole for the American people, are unknown, unseen, and sometimes at risk. In 1975, Congress created the first National Marine Sanctuary and a system to manage and protect these areas, which extend from the Atlantic to the Pacific and include some of the most remote island groups in the world. These sanctuaries represent a microcosm of the entire ocean and reflect the best and the worst of human activity. There are areas that remain so rich they remind us of what a healthy ocean is like, while other places have been devastated and are being restored. But do we really know what's there, and are we doing enough? Our expedition will take us to each of these marine sanctuaries. It's going to be hard work for my team, and sometimes dangerous. But along the way, we'll experience some of the greatest adventures the ocean has to offer. I think it's time that we explore and discover America's underwater treasures. For Jean-Michel's team, it would be a nine-month odyssey, over 30,000 miles of highway, 342 dives, and enough air miles to fly around the world 20 times. Due to the scale of this undertaking, Jean-Michel will delegate certain expeditions to his son and daughter, Fabienne and Céline, the third generation of Cousteau explorers. The adventure begins at what we all think a sanctuary should be, in a remote part of the Florida Keys National Marine Sanctuary. here for a rare experience. Fact is that 90% of all large fish in the world are gone, have been overfished. Here though, they'll find the endangered Goliath grouper. Theirs is a story of hope. Have a good dive. Each year groupers gather on shipwrecks and reefs in southern Florida to mate. And scientists come to look for the 800 pound giants and to estimate their population size. Some may be as old as 50. Groupers are vulnerable to overfishing because they come together at predictable times and places and are territorial, refusing to budge, making them easy targets for spearfishing. They're so huge, smaller fish use them as a separate habitat.
people watch this, uh, they've got to understand that we're here and we're showing this as an exception to the rule. I mean, you don't find dozens of group of Goliath grouper everywhere. I mean, it's just here and maybe another another few places, but it's definitely a national treasure. Good dive. Oh my God. <laughs> we got so close to him too. All around the group. Yeah. Big ball of fish around the big fish. Yep, that was and he just sat there at the bow line. He didn't move and I'm just floating next to him. <laughs> These fish were nearly exterminated in the Florida Keys until legislation was passed over 15 years ago. Don DeMaria, a fisherman turned conservationist, used to fish these giants and recounts his experiences for Jean-Michel. These are from some of the wrecks we dived in the Gulf. The trip we just went how, on. How long ago was that? Oh, this was, this was 83 here. These are all Goliath groupers here. There were lots of fish like bees on the wrecks. It didn't take long after the wreck was discovered. It's pretty much gone. But there's just too many of us, taking too many for too long. They've been protected in the United States yes. since, uh, since 1990. The protection worked, and this population is recovering. But it'll take it a long time for it to recover to some, some historical uh, unfished state. There are a lot of things about this species that we don't know. What we do know is that it has a complicated life cycle. They spend part of their life, the beginning of their life, in an estuarine environment. Uh, they move off to shallow water reefs, and then they migrate uh, distances up to 100 miles to go to spawning aggregation sites. But So there are clusters of them at these aggregation sites, but then they're dispersed over a broader area the rest of the year. From a protective point of view, even though the species is protected, there's a growing interest in catch and release of Goliath grouper, you know, just going and catching a three or four hundred pound fish and, and bringing it up and then releasing it. But there's just no question that the physiological stress on an animal that size <laughs> being brought up, and particularly if it's brought up from death, uh, the it's likelihood of survival is, is pretty low. And again, if you're going to protect any species, um, you ha can't just protect one stage of the life cycle. You can't just protect spawning aggregations. There are other parts of the life cycle that can present bottlenecks. And what we found with Goliath grouper is that mangrove may be just that bottleneck to their production. And mangrove loss has been uh, pretty, pretty great in this region. Now, what? brought you to explore your own backyard, the mangrove, because that's not where the big groupers you were after uh, sit and wait. They, they come up here for a period of their life, and then they go up where you used to catch them. Right. Well, it's just a fun place. You can come back here in just about any kind of weather and swim around and sort of seeing all the little ones. And of course, it's no secret. Everybody knows the small ones are here. They seem to like the current and the shade. It's an incredibly important place for juvenile fish to grow up. When you dive under there and there's lots of small snappers and of course the juvenile goliath group or it's a nursery area. Even in the most productive mangrove areas, they're not producing as many fish in a year as the fishery took in the, in the 80s, just the recreational component. What is your wish for this environment to be properly taken care of. What, what else can we do? I think what we really need are just some protected no-take areas. Just leave the fish alone, let them do their thing. You know, have a juvenile habitat like this where nobody molests them, just look at them. The fish need a break. If you give them a bit of a break, they, they, they bounce back. North of Los Angeles, an experiment is taking place to see if banning fishing in protected areas will bring back big fish. At the Channel Islands National Marine Sanctuary, warm southern currents and cold, nutrient-rich northern currents mix around five islands in the sanctuary closest to a megacity. Look at those guys. The few traffic jams here involve only sea lions. They're so playful. Hey, you! Hey, you! Ah. <laughs> They are so curious. 
That's okay. That was just a joke. This is a multi-use sanctuary, rich enough for both wildlife and people, in what is called the North American Galapagos. It is also a national park and playground for those who come for the enchantment of a place where even the water itself seems alive. But these waters have also seen hard times, and it's led to some innovative experiments. I mean, this is one of the more unique sanctuaries that has no take zones. They're meant to operate together. We hope that they're going to be linked by movement of larvae and movement of animals on the reef. It's a, it's a true network of reserves. That's new. All of these activities normally take place in the sanctuary, um, fishing, um, other extractive sort of uses. But in these no-take areas, right, they're complete closures. You can boat through them, but you can't fish, you can't take anything. But that's also why we have sites along the shoreline. We want to make sure that we have plenty of monitoring sites inside the marine reserves and plenty of monitoring sites outside. We're really trying to understand the effects. What's going to happen due to these closures? It takes about six months, though, of solid diving to survey all the sites throughout the Channel Islands wow. in one year. That is a lot of work. It's a lot of work. I counted 17 whole strands of kelp. So you just grab the whole kelp and then pull each dive apart. One, two. Yeah. The one of the reasons that we don't just count the plants themselves, we count each individual stipe, is we found in the past a good relationship between the number of stipes and the fish density. Not the number of plants. It's more important how large the plants are. And not, is there an interaction between the urchins and the stipes? Urchins actually eat the kelp. Mostly, they prefer to eat kelp that has dropped and the fronds are all laying on the bottom. But in the absence of, of that, they'll mow down the kelp. And that, in turn, results in just areas that are just covered by urchins alone. And those are called urchin barrens. The fluctuation from kelp forest to urchin barren is accelerated when large fish and lobsters that eat urchins are overfished, impairing the natural cycle of the kelp's recovery. The resilient kelp forest is a constantly changing vast habitat and shelter to thousands of species, small and large. It's a forest that reaches for the sunlight, growing two feet a day, and then fades, vulnerable to rising water temperatures. Over eons, it has diminished and rebounded. To the California sea line, plentiful and playful after 50 years of protection from hunting, the kelp forest forms the architecture of its lush home. laughing while you guys were yeah, filming because no, they, there were several of them going right back at you, just kind of no, looking no, over your head, <laughs> shaking, <laughs> going, what are they filming? <laughs> What's going on? Yay, it was good. Good time, good times. Another one. Excellent, excellent. To both ancient and modern mariners, dolphins racing to the ship always means good fortune. For its size, the Channel Island Sanctuary is visited by more kinds of dolphins, whales, seals, and sea lions than anywhere in the world. These are our closest relatives in the sea, and with true grace, they rush to greet us. I just can't believe the sheer number of them. Wow. Oh, beautiful jump. Other animals are not as easy to find, but are important to follow. 
Well, anytime you draw a line on a map with the intention of protecting or managing something, you clearly are interested in whether or not the animals you're interested in protecting or conserving are moving back and forth across that boundary. Unfortunately, for mobile animals like fish, we have very little information about how these animals move. The type of tags we're using, acoustic tags, or pingers as we call them, look like this. And here's, this, is a, this is one size of an acoustic pinger. This goes in a fish. In a fish. And here's another one for the smaller fish. This is an example of an acoustic receiver or listening station, which sits on the seafloor where we deploy it, and it sits in constant listening mode. Each yellow circle that you see here in large, and then several of the smaller circles around, it represents one of these receivers. So that's a receiver is at the center of those circles with a diameter of about 1,000 meters or one kilometer. To date, since 2000, we've tagged over 200 fish. In fact, one giant sea bass made the trip from the, the western end of Catalina to Anacapa in 24 hours across very deep water, which is pretty remarkable stuff. I mean, that's one of the exciting things about tagging fish, is that every time you put a tag on a fish, you learn something new. Okay. Have you seen a difference between the no-take zones and the areas where the sanctuary allows fishing and, and taking of these animals? The system here of no-takes has only been in place for about three years. Responses of the organisms might take a little bit longer than that, but I can tell you what we expect to see. We expect the fish to be larger inside relative to outside. We expect there to be a higher abundance and those sorts of changes. It is also expected that this abundance will spill over into the Channel Islands fishing areas. So has the uh, squid fishery been pretty consistent over the years, or does it fluctuate a lot? Yeah, squid fishery is the number one fishery in the state of California. They, they have these light boats that are, that are just lit up with lights. They come up, they're actually mating under the lights at night. Abundance has blessed the market squid, California's $31 million fishery. A bonanza since 1863 and a fishery regulated only in the last few years. The squid's abundance is phenomenal. In one recent season, the catch was 70,000 metric tons. The next year, it fell close to zero. It wasn't overfishing, but El Nino. Rising water temperatures plummeted their numbers or forced the squid into deeper water. Between natural fluctuations and a historic free-for-all, how had the squid survived? It's all about their life cycle. Squid live for only one breeding season. The females lay 20 to 30 long capsules containing two to 300 eggs each, and then they die. The fishery catches them on their spawning grounds, hopefully after their eggs are laid, to guarantee the next season's catch. Some fishermen understand the delicate balance and have regulated the catch themselves. This is the way it was done from the start, by hand. If they're not taken in large quantities, they have a chance to lay their eggs and reproduce in here. So this is pretty cool. We just take two ton and we go home. For now, the rich Channel Islands ecosystem seems able to sustain the squid fishery. But since it all takes place at night, offshore, practically no one is watching. But what about something that looms above the horizon? Something enormous. Perhaps nowhere else in the country is an oil platform more part of a thriving ecosystem than in the Flower Garden Bank's National Marine Sanctuary. This is home to the northernmost coral reef in the continental United States. Like all coral reefs, this is a living landscape and a critical habitat for the greatest diversity in all the sea. We have a long-term monitoring program at the Flower Garden Banks to monitor the health of the coral reef. And we have shown that the coral reef here is extremely healthy. It's thriving. And this is in spite of the fact that there is a, an operating a uh, natural gas platform within a mile or so of the coral reef top of the, of the East Flower Garden Bank. To see just how this balance is maintained, Jean-Michel and Fabien have come to this natural gas platform where efforts such as zero sewage and water discharge are voluntarily practiced. Salut. Voilà. I am always very intrigued uh, about the relationship that exists between industry 
and the ocean. If you look out at the water here and you see all these fish, you see this beautiful clear water, we don't want to change that. And, and certainly if we can do anything to, to help preserve the sanctuary, that's what we're going to do. We still need to, to generate energy. Well, this heats or cools 130,000 homes every day. And there's no reason why we can't do this safely. I mean, I, I, I can't say that, yeah, it's zero risk, because it's not. There is some risk involved in it. The oil rig phenomenon is the same as with shipwrecks. Suddenly a new surface is available to the encrusting sea life, always competing for space. And the explosion of life creates an oasis. But as reassuring as this dive is, it's nothing compared to what awaits the team after the sun sets. From what I understand, we're going at a very uh, opportune time. How they do it, we're not quite sure, but many coral species release their eggs and sperm at an exact time every year. Uh, one of the most spectacular events in, in nature. It turns out at the flower garden banks, this happens to be between seven and 10 nights after the full moon in August. Here we go. Let's get wet. The Flower Gardens Reef may originally have been formed from corals that drifted from Mexico hundreds of miles away, 15,000 years ago. The process is the same everywhere. Once a year, different species broadcast their gametes into the currents to be fertilized and carried away to start another colony. It begins slowly. Then it explodes, an upside down snowstorm, living fireworks, the reef's hidden orgy of life. These simple coral animals around the world simultaneously sense the full moon and release the future of their species to drift in the currents. But nearby, in parts of the Florida Keys, this precisely timed continuation of life has failed. Holly and Celine join Dr. Margaret Miller as her team collects eggs and sperm during a coral spawning event. We work at that site for Elkhorn Coral a lot because it's really the largest and healthiest Elkhorn Coral stand that remains in the upper Florida Keys. And we learned a couple of years ago that all of that coral, all those coral colonies, even though there's what, maybe a couple hundred colonies there, they're all a single genetic individual because it's isolated from other populations by, you know, at least a half a kilometer to a kilometer. It's probably unlikely that in nature it's able to reproduce on its own sexually because it's just too far away from any other genetically distinct individuals. And so if we can get spawn from two different colonies that are next to each other, we have a pretty good chance of being able to get good cross fertilization that way. It's still Dr. Miller allows baby now. corals to develop on tiles in their laboratory. And then she transplants them to help increase the number of coral colonies in the sanctuary. The Elkhorn coral is one of the ones that's most impacted by disease. And unfortunately, this is a threat that we don't understand very well in terms of what's causing it. We know that, that these disease impacts seem to be uh, much worse than they used to be, but we don't understand what possible management actions we might take to be able to mitigate. The Florida Keys National Marine Sanctuary contains the third longest barrier reef in the world adjacent to its 126-mile island chain. As a tourist destination, it receives millions of people annually, and 90% of branching corals here are dead or diseased, 
So careful management is critical. If people can't come to see clear water, healthy coral reefs, and lots of fish, the Keys are in, are in trouble as far as their economic future. The Keys right now are going through a lot of heartache to make sure that sewer systems, wastewater systems, are up to a standard that's going to provide clean water for our coral reef ecosystem. 70 miles from Key West is one of the ocean's oases where commercial fishing is banned. It's the Dry Tortugas National Park, called dry by mariners for its lack of drinking water, and site of Fort Jefferson that once protected the entrance to the Gulf of Mexico. This place really is a treasure. It has more beautiful pinnacles and coral forests than, than any place I know in the sanctuary. It's a treasure that we need to protect. Additionally protected by complete no-take status is the true Ocean Eden of Tortuga's ecological reserve. to reach people about the importance of the oceans because they can't see it. And unless you're a diver and you go to visit some areas, you really don't have the chance to see it up front and, and close. And that's what causes people to protect ecosystems as they know it, they love it, and, and that's what we need to do is, is let people know about what's under the surface of the oceans and then what's affecting it as well. But what your dad always says. <laughs> people protect what they love. Mm -hmm. It's very true. Corals are not the only animals in the sanctuary that need attention. Green turtles in Florida and elsewhere are afflicted with fleshy tumors growing on their eyes and body. This is that disease, fibopapilloma, uh, been around since the late 1800s. We really don't know a lot about it other than it is caused by a herpes virus. Uh, it's the actual only globally infectious disease known um, out there. And it's found primarily in the green sea turtle, but it has been documented in all species except for the leatherback. One of the sad things about this disease is the disease itself doesn't actually kill them. It's the sequelae of the disease. In other words, if that tumor gets so big she goes blind, she can't eat. Right. And then, then sadly, she starves to death. Uh, they also get these tumors, of course, on their body, and it can be on the flippers, and they get large, the size of a grapefruit. And they'll get several of those. It'd be like, you can imagine what it does to the aquadynamics of them being able right, to they swim. swim. They can't swim, so it, it, it exhausts them, uh, and they starve to death. So again, the, the, the virus itself doesn't kill them per se. It's the effects of the virus and the effects of the, of the tumors on the skin. At the Turtle Hospital in Marathon, Florida, Dr. Doug Mater uses a laser to remove tumors from the eye of a green turtle that will then be released, freed from its burden, but not cured of this ocean-wide disease. While continuing efforts to battle the tumor epidemic draw attention to the green sea turtle, the most common turtle in Florida is the loggerhead, listed as a threatened species since the late 70s. The entire southeastern coast, as well as the Gulf of Mexico, is their domain. And a key study has been ongoing at the coast of Georgia for decades. The Gray's Reef National Marine Sanctuary draws turtles to this habitat 17 miles offshore and 60 feet below the surface. We call it a crossroads. Uh, because you see a lot of, uh, of temperate organisms, cold water species that live here, right next door to uh, their warmer water cousins. They're colder water corals, and they don't build the reef. They live on top of it. And you'll find ledges that uh, go back about 15 or 20 feet. You'll see these areas, they look like um, turtle garages. Um, they're areas that are carved out into the rock and uh, they'll just rest there. One thing we don't fully understand is how they utilize the resources at Grace Reef. Um, but uh, we do know that we see a lot of turtles out there prior to the breeding season and during the breeding season uh, when they've nested and go back out to, uh, to Grace Reef to rest and forage. Snaking through the marsh channels south of Savannah at high tide, Greg taxis Fabian and the team to Wausau Island, 
where the Coretta Research Project has studied loggerhead turtles for 30 years. Loggerheads will nest on Wausau's beaches at night all summer long. Mike, how are you? Hey, Papillon. Wausau is now a national wildlife refuge and the most unspoiled of Georgia's barrier islands. You know, if you look at Wausau's database, which is about 30, 31 years old, we see an increase in the number of nests and the number of individuals laying nests on Wausau. Statewide trends show uh, pretty much stability or uh, indiscernible decline. So that means, you know, we've got a handle on the, this part of the conservation end of it. We know how to make baby turtles, pump them out there into the ocean, keep the population up. Not knowing when or if any turtles will nest each night brings little peace of mind on a tight expedition schedule. Bobby Ann can only hope for a bit of luck. To do the night surveys, researchers use only red light, the shortest wavelength in the color spectrum, to see it but not disturb the turtles. After a long insect-infested night, less than an hour before dawn, Fortune smiles on the team. A nesting female is spotted, still laying her eggs. Yeah, she's, uh, the hormones in her system are kind of walked out right now. The intensity of her mission permits the researchers close access without disturbing the process. Loggerheads are named for a strong skull surrounded by muscle, then another protective layer of bone so they can easily crush thick-shelled snails, crabs, and whelks. Growing up to four feet long and up to 400 pounds, the females drag their cumbersome bodies onto the beaches where they too were hatched, completing an ancient cycle. Loggerheads start to breed at 25 years or older and will lay 100 eggs in a couple of nests every two or three years. The eggs will hatch in about two months, also at night for safety, and the babies must fend for themselves. There she goes, she's, she's about to take off. <laughs> This is the full extent of her mothering, and the sea then reclaims her. Outside the sanctuary, loggerheads face the threat of nets and the long lines of commercial fishing. The use of turtle exclusion devices, or TEDs, by the shrimping industry has not only helped protect the turtles, but diminished the bycatch waste as well. We're, we're not out here trying to hurt the environment. I mean, if there was a way we could catch nothing but shrimp, that's exactly what we would do. I mean, there's no advantage for us to catch tons of fish that just mash the shrimp all up. We have this small net here that we pull about every 15 or 20 minutes, and it gives us a reading, and we know from it if we're doing good or we're doing bad or if we're catching too much bycatch, we'll pick up and go somewhere else. <laughs> All right, guys, you're alive, too. You go. These are turtle excluders. This version is what we call a hard TED, which has, it has uh, narrow bars, larger fish, turtles, horseshoe crabs, jelly balls. They all come out this escape opening. How much have you been able to reduce the bycatch uh, on these? The hard TED, I would say maybe 35%. Reduces a lot of work that the crew has to do because yeah. all that stuff is excluded. Otherwise, and, uh, you'd have to clear the decks of all the Someone would have to pick through it. While there is some bycatch, it's nothing like the reports yeah, of this... old data that they have of where we catch 20, 30 pounds of bycatch for every pound of shrimp. I mean, not every drag is this clean, but most of them are typically like this. Turtle exclusion and bycatch devices are limiting the staggering waste linked to the shrimping industry. But they're expensive at a time when unregulated shrimp from Asia have outcompeted the American market. 
back in the 80s, middle 80s, we were getting $6 a pound for shrimp. Now we may get three. Not too many people are gonna do it for the money. While new technology can improve on reducing unintended catch, like turtles, once the fishing net is lost, it becomes part of an anonymous and deadly graveyard known as ghost fishing. On the Olympic Coast National Marine Sanctuary, off Washington State, a vibrant sea hides a little known fact of life underwater. Anytime you go out and put something in the marine environment, there's a chance you're gonna lose it. Fishermen don't wanna lose these nets. It's a very detrimental economic impact to them to lose one of these nets. They're quite expensive. They're hard to replace and you lose harvest time when, when the net's gone before you can replace it. So the fishermen are our main source of reports. The coal nutrient rich waters off the Olympic coast have supported fishing for centuries, especially for four Indian tribes, the Quinault, Ho, Quileut, and Moka, who have lived with the sea for hundreds of years. Well, this is a very unique sanctuary in that we have coastal tribes with treaty rights. And what that means is those rights existed before the designation of the sanctuary. And the tribes are very clear that they were supportive of a sanctuary being designated if it didn't infringe on the practice of those treaty rights. So that is um, very much inherent in our regulations, in our policies, in our programs, is that we will work with tribes. The Olympic Coast Sanctuary and the Macaw have developed a program to remove lost fishing gear that is killing marine life. We came together, we said, is this a common objective for both of us? Yes. How do we structure it? How do we train tribal divers so that they can participate in the removal projects? And so essentially building their capacity to do this type of work themselves. The thing about things underwater is that the general public rarely gets underwater and they don't see this type of material. I always say if these nets were stretched out along the freeway you know, in your neighborhoods and had uh, animals entangled in them like we see under the water, that there'd be a huge public outcry about this and there'd be millions of dollars spent cleaning it up just like we do for our highways. But because it's underwater and nobody sees it, it's out of sight, out of mind. And we're just now collecting the information that can get that, that story out to the public and get some interest. In it. Jean-Michel's team is anxious to dive with the giant Pacific octopus and wolf eels, two icons of these rich Olympic waters. Wolf eels are actually fish that mate for life and are beautifully designed to eat sea urchins. The giant Pacific octopus is the largest in the world and can weigh up to 400 pounds. Smart and masters of camouflage, they're called the ocean's soft intelligence. When it comes to the predatory sunflower sea star, even tiny scallops are smart enough to flee. with the Olympic Coast. We recognized it for what it is and what it can be. And we said, we're gonna hand it down to future generations in the shape that it's in now. And as you can see, it's, it's a spectacular place. Far off the Olympic Coast, another species passes hidden. There is a sanctuary dedicated to protecting this one species in one place during one critical season. The Hawaiian Islands Humpback Whale National Marine Sanctuary. This Hawaiian sanctuary protects the only breeding population of humpback whales in U.S. waters, here at the world's most isolated archipelago. Jean-Michel and the team are granted rare access to approach the humpbacks only by federal permit. Humpback whales are endangered. In 
two-thirds of the North Pacific population comes to Hawaiian waters. The whale's presence attracts a curious public, both onshore and the whale-watching vessels. Here, they compete and mate. And newborn calves gain strength for the trip to Alaska, where they feed. Here, too, they play. Humpback whales are called singing whales. Well, some of the whales sing, yeah. Male humpback whales sing, uh, but the whales do a lot more than just sing. They're extremely aggressive whales at times. Uh, certainly they're beautiful animals. What's the population? The population uh, in this area is approximately 5,000 animals throughout the course of, of a winter season. Uh, worldwide, we certainly know a lot less than we do about the whales here. Uh, we would guess it to be 20 to 25,000 humpback whales. Declared endangered nearly 40 years ago, there was hope that their numbers would rapidly increase, but it has been slow. For each breath the whales take, they must rise to the surface where they encounter the conditions that we impose on this vast sea. But at least here in this sanctuary, they have found a truce with us. And here we can share the dream of a future for the whale. I was like, oh, ah! just a I'm like, so <laughs> let's do it again. <laughs> and those guys are all competing for her attention, basically. Yeah, they fight for that position closest to the female. Okay. So chasing, grunting, bubbling. What are the major threats to the whales right here in the sanctuary? The two main. Um, uh, threats, human threats for large baleen whales seem to be ship strikes, collisions with boats, and, and entanglement. And unfortunately, it may be their personality that's a little bit of their downfall with humpbacks. They like to play with things. They, I've seen them play with logs and, and buckets and pieces of kelp. And apparently, if there's debris in these, in these patches of weed or seaweed out there, they may get entangled in it. In these waters, the whales are extremely well protected. Uh, as they leave these waters and they leave American waters, you know, then it's up to the country whose, whose borders the whales are around. And they do tend to be a border uh, species, so they live near shore. Uh, but yeah, in, in Russia, there's no protection whatsoever. Same off the coast of Japan. So to me, it appears that when it comes to marine mammals, mm -hmm. we're doing a lot better than we have done with the fish population, which is in a particular, the large fish is in complete decline. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, there was a, a worldwide moratorium on the taking of large whales in 1966. So since that time, uh, one would presume that many of the populations have at least begun to recover from the decimation of whaling during the early 20th century. Uh, for the fish populations, nothing like that has been in place. There have been very, very few regulations, certainly worldwide, 
very few regulations, so the fish populations are continuing to plummet while the whale populations at this point are probably recovering. And the health of the humpback whale population is at least an indicator of what the health of the ocean is. So the fact that you know these whales are numbering around 10% of what they were before whaling days indicates that there are major imbalances in the marine ecosystems of the world. So there is a direct link between uh, the work that you're doing, the well-being of these whales, and the quality of our lives. Absolutely, because while we may not depend upon whales for food, the whales depend upon the same fish that, that we feed on. Uh, the entire marine ecosystem is interlinked. Uh, so the study of one endangered species, whether it be a whale, a fish, or a shark, or an invertebrate, is very important because everything that we learn about each piece of the ecosystem improves our ability to manage the entire ecosystem at a sustainable level. And the ability of these whales to recover is in some ways reflective on the ability of the ocean to recover if the right policies are in place. On the next Jean-Michel Cousteau Ocean Adventures, the exploration of America's underwater treasures continues as the Cousteau team reveals more of the National Marine Sanctuaries, from the largest to the most remote and inaccessible. But are the sanctuaries making a difference? And what secrets do these waters hold about our past and future? The team is here for a rare experience. The fact is that 90% of all large fish in the world are gone, have been overfished. Here, though, they'll find the endangered Goliath grouper. Theirs is a story of hope. Have a good dive. Each year, groupers gather on shipwrecks and reefs in southern Florida to mate. And scientists come to look for the 800-pound giants and to estimate their population size. Some may be as old as 50. Groupers are vulnerable to overfishing because they come together at predictable times and places and are territorial, refusing to budge, making them easy targets for spear fishing. Dive into America's coastal waters and discover a fascinating world rich with life and history. A realm of vibrant diversity, from the odd and reclusive to some of the largest creatures on Earth. Join Jean-Michel and the Cousteau team as they explore America's underwater treasures and the national marine sanctuaries created to better understand and protect them. It's Jean-Michel Cousteau, Ocean Adventures. and sometimes at risk. In 1975, Congress created the first National Marine Sanctuary and a system to manage and protect these areas, which extend from the Atlantic to the Pacific and include some of the most remote island groups in the world. These sanctuaries represent a microcosm of the entire ocean and reflect the best and the worst 
of human activity. There are areas that remain so rich that remind us of what a healthy ocean is like, while other places have been devastated and are being restored. But do we really know what's there and are we doing enough? Our expedition will take us to each of these marine sanctuaries. It's gonna be hard work for my team and sometimes dangerous. But along the way, we'll experience some of the greatest adventures the ocean has to offer. I think it's time that we explore and discover America's underwater treasures. For Jean-Michel's team, it would be a nine-month odyssey, over 30,000 miles of highway, 342 dives, and enough air miles to fly around the world 20 times. Due to the scale of this undertaking, Jean-Michel will delegate certain expeditions to his son and daughter, Fabienne and Céline, the third generation of Cousteau explorers. The adventure begins at what we all think a sanctuary should be, in a remote part of the Florida Keys National Marine Sanctuary. More than half of America's borders are water, stretching over 12,000 miles of coastline. But a country doesn't end at the shore. It extends far into the ocean, lakes, and into the deep. Within these waters are found some of America's most important natural resources, places of incomparable beauty and irreplaceable artifacts of history all underwater treasures that, on the whole, for the American people, are unknown, unseen.